The branches of the tall pines and maples swayed back and forth in the powerful wind. They reached out over the water, leaving a nice shadow for us to park our little fishing boat under. God damn it, I almost had him, Jerry shouted aloud. <laughs> That's the third bite you've had today, yet you still can't catch anything. I laughed in response, pulling my rod back before whipping it forward to send the bait flying. It was a nice and sunny noon, aside from the dark, towering clouds rising over the horizon. We only had one bass in the cooler in the middle of the boat, one I had caught about 40 minutes earlier. The wind was growing more and more powerful, making it hard to cast and making the waves rock the boat. The thunder rumbled in the distance, and Jerry turned to me with a frown. Yeah, we better get back to the cabin. We don't want to get stuck out here in a bad thunderstorm, he said to me. His shaggy brown hair waving around like a flag. I laughed at the sight and nodded my head in agreement as Jerry started up the trolling motor. We were decently far from his house, so it took about 15 minutes to get there from our fishing spot. It was sunny in the direction we were heading, but behind us, darkness loomed. Once we arrived, I saw Jerry's brother, Robert, relaxing on the front porch of the cabin, reading a book. And this surprised me, as I'd always known Robert as the less intelligent one, and not the one to read books. He set it down and came to help us dock the small vessel in a little slip. Any luck? he asked. The only bite I had was a nice bass. Your brother, on the other hand, had three bites but couldn't reel one in. I responded. Oh well, we could still skin and fry that bass for some food tonight. We got off the boat and Jerry and Rob headed up the stairs into the porch while I stayed down on the dock to clean the bass. As I worked, I watched the almost black storm grow and take over the blue sky. The storm moved quickly and seemed to come out of nowhere. That morning, there hadn't been a cloud in sight and I'd never seen anything like it before felt unnatural. I hurriedly finished and headed back up into the cabin. Now the cabin was old and small and a little dirty inside. It was red bricked with a brown wooden roof. The red on the bricks had faded into more of a brown color, which made the cabin really blend in with the environment around it. It was hard to see from far away. Jerry and Rob were in the kitchen cleaning up, and our other friend Sal and his girlfriend Olivia were on the couch watching a funny television show. We had insisted on Sal not bringing his girlfriend, telling him it was going to be a guy's trip, but he brought her anyway, saying he hardly got to spend any vacation time with her like this. You see, none of us really liked her, as we thought she was too controlling in Sal's life, but we wanted to hang out with the guy and he wouldn't come without her. Jerry had a little weather alert radio on the kitchen counter, and he was playing it. The National Weather Service has issued a severe thunderstorm warning for the following counties. It named almost every county in the state, and then followed to say the storm was also in a multitude of other states nearby. Be prepared for strong winds, heavy rain, flooding, and lightning. There's also a slight chance of hail and tornadoes. Jesus, we're going to get slammed. Jerry's eyes had widened as he listened. Yeah, looks like the damn apocalypse is coming out there. I laughed. We debated driving back to town, but decided not to, as we would probably get caught up in the storm in the long ride back. More and more thunder rumbled, and I stepped out onto the porch to watch the dark clouds engulf the sky above us. Lightning flashed around the cabin, and it was starting to rain. The wind was making the boat bounce back and forth between the sides of the dock. I just hope our knots would keep it attached. The slanted rain began to shoot the screen covering the porch, soaking me in the furniture. The wind pushed it hard, and it was painful getting hit by it. Felt like little pricks or airsoft bullets. I hurried back inside with little red dots on my arms and face. The wind was so violent, 
It began to shake even the thick oaks surrounding the land around us. The lake and the area around the cabin were heavily wooded with big trees. Now all of them were shaking, and I was afraid one would come crashing down on us at any second. And then the rain grew so heavy that I couldn't even see past the porch. Sal and Olivia were cuddled up on the couch, and me and Rob and Jerry were discussing the storm in the kitchen. I've never seen anything like this before. This could cause some serious damage to the cabin. Hell, the dock is probably broken off by now. Jesus, Dad's gonna be pissed. Jerry laughed. His laugh was interrupted by a bright flash and a loud clap of thunder. The flow of lightning and the torrential rain continued throughout the day. The power would flicker constantly, but never entirely go out. The weather radio just continued to repeat itself, updating with the new tornado alerts for the new counties every now and then. It showed no signs of slowing down, so we just put in a funny movie and we all sat down to enjoy it. It was hard to hear over the thunder and the wind, and we would be constantly interrupted by the power outages. By the time we finished, it was around 10 at night, and we all decided to go to sleep. Now, there was only three rooms, so Jerry had been sleeping out on the couch, and the noise of the storm made it easier for me to drift off to sleep easily. I woke to sunlight beaming through the windows. Hmm storm must have worn off overnight, thought to myself as I climbed out of the bed. I flicked the light switch, but the light didn't come on. Power must have gotten knocked out by the storm. I walked into the living room, seeing Robert down by the dock, observing the damage. I went out to meet him. A huge pine had fallen into the lake, and another one was leaning on an oak tree. If that oak tree hadn't been there, it would have crushed the cabin. Luckily, the dock was hardly damaged, and the boat was still attached. I might as well call Dad, tell him we're alright. Here, let me see your phone, Rob spoke. I had the best carrier out of everyone else, and my phone was the only one with barely enough signal to call anyone. I handed him my phone, and he turned it on. Hey, that's weird. It says you don't have any bars. He handed it back to me. Yeah, maybe something happened in the storm. Anyway, I'm going to make breakfast. Rob suggested going back home, but we decided to wait and see if my service came back. It never did. I turned on the weather radio to listen to any updates, but I just heard static. I thought it might have been something wrong with the equipment itself. Sal and Olivia decided to fish the rest of the day while the rest of us set up some targets out in the field to practice shooting. Throughout the day, we saw several military jets fly over, but Jerry said he had seen that here before, so we didn't pay much attention to it. We were running out of actual targets to shoot at, so we just set up bottles. Between Jerry and Rob, I was the worst shot out of all of them. Now, this was a given. I mean, I hardly ever use guns, but it didn't stop them from laughing when I missed, and the day crept on, and eventually we decided to head back late afternoon. Sal and Olivia had caught four fish, and Sal claimed Olivia caught almost all of them. Naturally, we didn't believe him, but we just let it slide. Jerry was probably beginning to regret inviting them for the trip, as Sal was just spending most of his time with Olivia anyway. I was walking out of the restroom when I heard the two of them speaking in the room next door. I put my ear to the door to hear their conversation better. Dude, you know, you're forgetting I'm the one who invited you here, not your clingy girlfriend. She's not clingy, alright? I'm just... Well, I'm sorry, she just wants to spend time with me. You wouldn't understand anyway. I know you've never had a girlfriend. Listen, all I'm asking is that you just spend a little bit more time with us. Psh, fine, whatever, man. I heard footsteps coming my way and stepped back as the door flung open and Sal came storming out. 
Jerry followed slowly behind me. He stopped when he saw me and turned to talk to me. You know, I'm beginning to think we shouldn't have brought him. It would have been much better fun with just the three of us. Now, nothing too weird happened for the rest of that day. The power never came back on. I never regained service, and we saw just a few more jets flying over us. Jerry figured his dad would come up to the cabin by now if he was really worried about us. Sal did take some time with us to go on a walk through the woods. Oddly, Olivia seemed fine with it and stayed at the cabin to read the book she had brought up. The sky became streaked with waves of purple and orange as the sun began to set, and we knew it was time to head back to the cabin. Luckily, Jerry and Rob had a few candles up there. And we, of course, had a few flashlights, so we wouldn't be in total pitch black. We were cleaning up dinner when Sal called us down to the dock. Hey, come take a look at this, guys. We all headed down except for Rob, who wanted to finish hand-washing the dishes. I immediately knew what he was talking about when I stepped outside on the porch. The moon, which hadn't risen that high in the sky at this point had turned into the color of blood. Now I'd seen that phenomenon before, but usually it had more of an orangish tint to it. This was straight red. Its reflection in the rippling water made the water look like blood. We all stared at it for a while, but eventually went back inside. Jerry had a battery-operated radio in a closet and pulled it out in hopes that we would know what was going on with the outside world. But as he turned the knob, flipping through the channels, our eyes widened with shock. The only noise coming out of the radio speakers was static. We have to go back. We have no idea what's going on out there. Rob was sitting on the couch and frantically looking around at all of us. Yeah, you're right, but I'm not sure we should all go. It could be dangerous. We could have been invaded by another country or something. Sal said. <laughs> Invaded, Sal. I laughed. I'll go back, I... No. It's me and Rob's cabin. Our father owns it. One of us will go back. Jerry interrupted. Jerry, I have the most powerful truck. After that storm, you have no idea what kind of wreckage is out there. Yeah, well, I could just drive your truck. Dude, it's not a big deal, man. Plus, you know I never let anyone else drive my truck. Sal kissed Olivia goodbye and headed out, taking nothing with him but a wallet, his phone, and a hat. Not to our surprise, the radio once again only played static after he started up his truck. We told him to call us when he got back into our area, but we never received a call from him, and we never saw Sal again. Fish. Fish again. All we ever eat is fish. I was twirling my food around my plate with a fork. It was true. We had fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We had only just run out of food in the pantry two days ago. I had only brought up enough for the trip. We still had a few granola bars, but I tried to save those as I had no idea how long we would be there. Dude, could be worse. I mean, do you really want to risk driving out and going to get something? I mean, Sal was supposed to be back three days ago, and we never got a call from him. Jerry responded. Well, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. There's a sandwich restaurant and a gas station about 30 or so minutes away from here. I'm sure we wouldn't be in danger going that far out. The cabin is surrounded by miles of woods, and the only road out is small and windy. It's a dirt one, you know that. The only reason whatever happened out there hasn't happened to us is because we're isolated in the middle of nowhere. Let's keep it that way. I sighed and got up to watch the setting sun from the glass door, which led to the porch from the living room. Olivia was lying on the couch, just staring off into the wall. See, she hadn't taken Sal's disappearance well. I mean, we tried to talk to her, but 
She just told us to be quiet. The only thing we could do for her now was wait until her grief left. The days passed slowly for us. There was nothing for us to do besides ride the storm out. Jerry was right. The chances of us being found out here were very slim. Now we all had our different theories of what was going on, but we mostly agreed it had to been an evasion of some sort. We originally thought it was just a really bad storm. But by now, surely the power would have come back on or someone would have come back out here to find us. And then there was the moon. You see, each night, it was still as crimson as blood. We thought it may have been caused by gas or something. But our opinion soon changed. That night. Robert had brought up s'mores. We had yet to cook them. We were all tired of eating fish that night, and Rob suggested bringing them out and making them over a small fire. We made it in the back of the cabin, in the small driveway which was at the bottom of a hill leading into the woods. Hey, Olivia, we're, um, we're gonna make some s'mores outside. You care to join us? I cautiously asked. Why would y'all want me to join you? She replied with a snarky tone. Well, why would you say that? Well, I know y'all hate me. I've seen the looks you gave me. <laughs> well, we don't hate you. You see, the truth is, I never forced Sal to take me up here. I never forced him to do anything. Go hang out with your friends, I'd tell him. But he insisted on spending all of his time with me. Now, I was shocked at this revelation. All these years, we had blamed her. Olivia, I'm sorry. Hey, y'all gonna come out? Fire's ready now. Jerry had stepped inside. Olivia began to slowly get off the couch. Yeah, I'll be right there. I shouted back to him. Nah, 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 nah. Hey, do y'all remember that time Rob flicked peanut butter on Sydney's shirt at lunch? And Sydney turned around and punched the shit out of him? We all erupted in laughter. I even saw Olivia giggle a little which made me smile. And then Rob got up and... Jerry was interrupted by a long, loud screech coming from the woods. This was followed by a chorus of yapping and growling. Our smiles faded away. I've heard coyotes before, and this did not sound like them. Plus, the coyotes had gone silent since the moon turned red. What is that? Olivia asked aloud. Jerry and Rob started frantically trying to put out the fire, dumping their waters all over it. The chorus was getting closer and sounded more and more angry. After putting it out, we all quickly ran inside, locking the door behind us. I went in and locked the other two doors in the cabin, and Rob went to go find the shotgun. He came back with a pump-action 12-gauge, just as the noises were nearing the cabin. The noises were just outside now, and whatever was making them was scratching the door. Rob raised the gun. Jerry responded by shaking his head and mouthing, No. We moved to the master bedroom of the cabin and waited in there. And the scratching lasted around 15 minutes before the pack of whatever was making that noise went away. Rob finally set the gun down. What the hell was that? I turned to Jerry. I've never heard a pack of coyotes or wild dogs sound like that. Honestly, I, I don't know. We kept the doors locked that night and kept the candles blown out. I brought a pistol with me to sleep. Something had found us now. Now things got weirder for the next following days. That morning... I decided to get up early and go turkey hunting. See, a nice turkey would be a refreshing change of pace from fish. I was armed with a shotgun, so I wasn't really scared of being out in the woods alone. I made sure to walk very far away from the cabin, past the edge of the property. A gunshot would be loud, and I didn't want any more things to be attracted to our location. I found a good tree in front of a large field and sat down to wait. Being alone allowed me to think freely without any interruptions. 
See, I was worried. I was worried about my family. I was worried about Sal. Worried about the rest of the world. None of us had talked about it last night, but hell, we were all thinking it. What if this wasn't some sort of other country's invasion? What if it was aliens or monsters? I drifted off to sleep thinking of all the possible reasons, and I heard whispers. My eyes shot open. The sun was hanging high in the middle of the sky. I'd been laying on the grassy ground, and so had my gun. I heard whispers coming from all around me. I thought I was dreaming and tried shaking my head, then I pinched myself, but the whispers remained. I felt chills run down my spine as I quickly jumped up and began to run across the field, back in the direction of the cabin. As I ran, I glanced back over my shoulder and saw something that made me stop dead in my tracks. My mother, my father, and my sister were all standing at the other end of the field. They were waving, and then beckoning me to come over to them. They all had smiles on their faces, but like the storm, they looked unnatural and fake. I took off into a full sprint. My adrenaline kept me going, and I didn't stop running until I reached our own property. And even then, I only slowed down to a jog. By the time I reached the cabin, I was panting, my chest hurt, and I was drenched in sweat. Fuck, that's the last time I go into the woods alone. And I thought to myself as I stepped into the cabin. Olivia was messing with the radio in the kitchen. Her eyes widened as she looked up at me. What happened to you? She asked. I saw something in those woods. I responded bluntly. Like what? Now this sounds crazy, but I think I saw my family out there. They were smiling and waving at me. Maybe you just miss them a lot. See, it's okay. I kind of miss my family too. Well, what about Sal? Damn it. Why would you ask that? I thought to myself as I waited for a response. I miss him, sure, and I hope he's alright, but not as much as my family. Our relationship was having a lot of trouble. I think him taking me here was a last-ditch effort to save it. There were a few seconds of awkward silence before I spoke again. How's that radio going? I asked. It's mostly been static, but earlier I heard a voice. A voice? Yeah, it kind of sounded like a man's, and it was asking for help, saying they were coming for him. Before I could respond, Jerry and Rob stepped in through the glass door, carrying three skinned bass with them. Dude, what happened to you? Jerry asked. There was something weird I saw in those woods, man. I'm not ever going out in them alone. I told him. The sudden realization hit me that whatever saw me, could have followed me back. What was in those woods? Jerry asked. I, I don't know. I'm not really sure what I saw. I told him. Now guys, maybe we're all just a little stressed out. Kind of need some relaxation? Olivia said. That's a, that's a good idea, Olivia. And we don't have any more alcohol up here, but we can still have some fun. I'll be back. Jerry ran into the master bedroom and came back holding a Monopoly box. Anyone down to get their ass kicked? He grinned. I was stepping out of the bathroom when Rob grabbed my shoulder and pulled me aside. It was 11 at night and the moon had once again remained its odd crimson color. I know what you saw in those woods. Rob spoke in a hushed tone. Listen, I don't think it was really anything, Rob. I think I was just seeing things. No. I see it too. When I go off alone. When I go fishing. I see my father. And he waves for me to come to him. I also hear these whispers telling me to do things. Well, have you talked to Olivia or Jerry about this yet? No. No. 
I don't think they've seen what we have. They aren't like us. Are you okay, man? I mean, how much sleep have you been actually getting? Not a lot. I've been staying up, keeping watch on us. I mean, something could break in at any time and we have no idea what's out there. I nodded my head in agreement, but couldn't help but feel there was something off about Rob. But considering we could be sitting in the middle of the apocalypse, I couldn't really blame him. You know, I've heard of stuff like this before, Rob called out to me as I was walking away. What do you mean, Rob? You ever seen Batman? Scarecrow uses this gas. Makes people hallucinate. You see their nightmares. Rob, this isn't some fantasy movie. No, 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 but I've seen documentaries, you see, on the History Channel. Armies before have tried to create something similar. Some sort of chemical or gas that drives someone crazy. Makes them see things. It would be perfect in a war. Well, let's hope that's not the case, I said and continued walking. But what he said made me think. Using some sort of gas to drive a population insane would make an invasion or worse, an extermination all that much easier. But so far, I haven't seen any green gas in the air at all. And so far, Rob and I were the only ones having any issues. I shook my head and tried to get this off my mind. Now things didn't get any better as more and more time went by. I asked Olivia and Jerry if they had been seeing things too. Jerry gave off a firm, what are you talking about? But Olivia responded with an anxious, no, I mean, why would I be having some weird visions going on in my head? Do you think I'm going crazy or something? She tried to hide it. But she wasn't a good liar. I decided to have a conversation alone with Jerry one night about it. I invited him out to the porch, and we sat in these two old wooden rockers that Jerry and his dad made when he was a kid. We waited in silence for a minute or two, just staring out into the serene, bright water, and the crimson moon perched just above it. We were both shivering, and my teeth chattered for a little bit. It was early fall in the south, yet ever since the storm, the temperature had been dropping significantly each day. At one point, I almost jumped up when a little brown spider crawled over my foot. I relaxed when I saw it was just a spider, but I freaked out even more when I saw the brown fiddle on the back and recognized it as a brown recluse. I stepped on it quickly, thankful it had not bitten me. I started to then open my mouth, but Jerry blurted, Have you ever read the book of Revelations before? I was a little startled by this, as I didn't really know Jerry as a religious man. I mean, I've skimmed through it, but never really sat down and intently read it. You see, there's this verse, 612, talks about the opening of the sixth seal, and the moon becoming as red as blood. I remained silent. What if the storm was the rapture? We haven't heard from a single person since it's happened. What if we're the only ones left behind? I turned around to tell him how ridiculous that sounded, but I could see how nervous he was. Listen, man, I don't think the world is ending. It's probably just some sort of biological attack from another country or something. We've been out here weeks, Jay. We have to see someone. We have to go check on something. Even if it is just our neighbors. Now, I thought of many reasons why that would be a bad idea, but I too was eager to discover the fate of the rest of civilization. For all we knew, we could be the last people on Earth. Alright then, tomorrow we'll head to that convenience store area. If other people are still out there, there's bound to be someone there. I think the two of us are the only ones that should go. Olivia seems to be losing it, and your brother can stay and watch her in the cabin. Jerry opened his mouth to respond, but was interrupted by a long screech coming from the woods, which was followed by more howls and growls. 
We started hearing noises like this around a week ago, and they'd become more and more frequent each night. And just the same as the nights prior, Jerry once said again, It's just bobcats and wild dogs. And I was sitting at a long wooden table, my family surrounding me. On top of the table, there was a surplus of food. Food I hadn't seen in weeks. Turkey, bread, beans, salad. We were out in an open, sunny field. My family was all smiling as they passed the food around. You can be with us, Jay. You can be happy. And then a loud, rumbling noise filled the atmosphere and the sky turned red. Now my family's faces were distorted and inhuman. I jumped up and squeezed my eyes shut. And when I reopened them, I was looking up at a dark wooden ceiling, and I was sweating. I jumped up out of my bed and looked around the dark room, but I saw nothing. I heard thuds on the wooden floor quickly coming towards my door. I grabbed the revolver that was on the nightstand and waited. The door flung open, and Jerry stepped in. I breathed a sigh of relief. Jesus, dude. You gotta say something before you just barge in. Hell, I almost shot you. I laughed a little. It's Olivia. She's gone. All my laughter left me as Jerry and I stepped back into the hallway. The room to Olivia's door was flung wide open, and her sheets were flung out on the floor. But that wasn't the disturbing part. There was a trail of scratches and blood leading out from her room to the open back door of the cabin. And directly behind the door and across the driveway were the thick, pitch black, and strangely silent woods. We gotta go get her, I urged to Jerry. What now? In the dark? That's suicide. Just wait until daylight. I tried to calm down and not let my emotions control me, but it was hard. What were the hell's Rob? He was supposed to keep watch. Jerry's face gave off an oh shit expression as he began to frantically look around the cabin. I ran to the kitchen and then the porch. What the hell? I thought as I stepped out onto it. Rob was sitting at the edge of the dock, just holding the shotgun and looking up into the sky. Rob? I shouted as I ran down to him. Isn't it all just beautiful? He responded as I ran up next to him. What? What are you talking about? And I shouted again. The stars. The moon. He responded almost joyfully. You were supposed to be watching the cabin. Olivia's gone now because of you. His facial expression changed immediately, like he just snapped out of some sort of daze. He quickly ran up to the cabin, swinging around the shotgun as he went. I followed him back up. Oh no, 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 no. I'm so sorry. He buried his face in his hands. None of us went back to sleep for the rest of that night. The moment dawn broke, we headed out into the forest, all armed. We made sure not to split up, although Rob would often straggle behind. We saw no trace of Olivia anywhere. No blood, no torn clothing, no nothing. We only shouted out a few times for fear that something else would hear us. After a few hours, we gave up on our search and headed back towards the cabin. I was scared. Not just for Olivia, but for us as well. See, we were no longer hidden, and whatever had found her was dangerous. It broke in and took her without a sound. Jerry and I decided to keep our promise of going out and seeing if we could find anyone. We almost had to at that point. Jerry came up to me while I was putting back on a thick jacket. Listen, Jay, I think you should take Rob with you instead. Why? See, I'm kind of worried about him lately. He's been acting strange. I think he's just got a case of cabin fever or something. I didn't mention the visions or whispers to him. Yeah, you know, you're right. It sounds like a good idea, but are you going to be okay here by yourself? I could see that he was gripping a Bible tightly in his right hand. Yeah, 
Yeah, you know, just... I'm gonna do some fishing, you know? Alright. Well, we'll be back in a few hours. Just... Just be careful, bud. I patted him on the shoulder before heading out to Rob's truck. Rob and I were silent as we drove down the dirt road and then the highway. The only thing we saw were a couple of mutilated deer and empty cars. I sat staring out the window, only able to think of Olivia and Sal. I feel really bad for Olivia, you know. I finally broke the silence. Why? Rob asked, but with a tone that suggested his mind was on other things. We always talked about how much she controlled Sal's life, how bad she was, you know, but I think it was the opposite now, I said. Well, why do you think that? Rob sounded a little bit more interested. You see, she told me all about it before she went missing, man. She told me about how Sal always makes her do things with him, even when she insists that he just goes off with us. I spoke sympathetically. Well, if we ever see them again, I'll tell her I'm sorry, Rob responded. I felt like he was drifting off again, back into his own mind, and somewhere far away from here. I don't think we're ever going to see either of them again, Rob. I spoke softly and went back to staring out the window. Rob remained quiet. The farther away from the cabin we went, the more uneasy I felt. We reached the convenience store by the afternoon. Rob and I both stepped out of the car, armed and ready for anything to come at us. But nothing did. There was a good number of empty cars in the parking lot and rode there. We had yet to see another car or person, so so I'd pretty much come to the conclusion that the rest of the world was in just as bad a shape as us. We gotta go check those cars. I'm going to go into the stores, Rob said to me quietly. I nodded and we split off. I noticed the air had gotten so cold I could see my breath now. I immediately noticed one of the cars had its doors ripped off, and I headed over to it. I winced a little when I looked inside. The interior was covered with blood. I looked back over to the car next to it and noticed that it too was covered with blood. Jay? I heard Rob scream and quickly ran over to the store. I stepped in with my gun raised, but Rob was completely fine. What are you doing screaming like that? I shouted angrily. Look! He pointed at the floor. I looked down and jumped back. The floor was covered with dried blood. As I looked around, I noticed the entire store was a mess. There were shelves knocked over and glass cracked and shattered. I even noticed a few shells on the floor, but like the cars, I didn't see any bodies. We moved on to the restaurant next door and were met with the same results. There was no sign of anyone anywhere. We tried the phones in the restaurant in the store, but they didn't work. We silently headed back out to the truck, with me in the lead. My jaw dropped when it came into sight. The truck tires... All four of them were flat. What the fuck? I heard come from behind me. What the fuck? Rob screamed. Rob? Can you shut up? I sneered at him through clenched teeth. Listen, we could still drive with flat tires, or at least slowly, but we don't have time to check anywhere else right now. We gotta get back to your brother. He's all alone, I said to Rob. Rob nodded, but I could see that he was angry. We drove back slowly. The screeching noise made from the wheels on the pavement was awful and loud. I tried not to think about it, but I knew that anyone and anything within a mile could probably hear us. We only made it ten minutes before the truck came to a grinding halt. Rob cursed as he got out of it. Oh no, I heard him mumble. My heart dropped when I saw what he was worried about. There was a trail of gas behind the truck. No, we're stuck out here. God damn it. Rob kicked the side of his truck. Well, it'll help if you'd be quiet. 
So just calm the fuck down, Rob. We hid for weeks from those fuckers, and now they're just too scared to face us? Come on, bitches. I covered my ears as Rob raised his shotgun high and fired into the sky. Well, I'm right here. You want a fucking fight? Come and get one. I wasn't going to let him get us both killed. Without hesitation, I drew my fist back and then socked him in the mouth. He fell to the ground, dropping the shotgun. Listen, Robert, you may have a death wish, but I sure as fuck don't. Those things out there are going to kill you, and our only chance is to make it back on foot before sunrise unless you want to end up like those deer over there. Are you with me? Rob nodded. Once again, it seemed like he had been broken out of a trance. He reached for the shotgun, but I grabbed it before he could. I'm going to keep this with me for now. Yeah, fine, he mumbled. We walked again in complete silence. There were empty cars every now and then on the side of the road, but neither of us knew how to hotwire one. As the sun lowered in the sky, I grew more and more nervous, and when I began to see the horizon turn orange and our shadows grow tall, I began to panic. We hadn't even hit the dirt road yet. Every now and then, I thought I would hear rustling in the woods around us. I wasn't sure if it was just harmless animals, but I felt like we were being hunted. We're gonna die out here, Rob said bluntly as the sky turned to purple. Dude, don't say that. We're nowhere near the cabin. It's gonna be dark any minute now. I heard a growl not too far off in the woods. I began to think of my family and my other friends, how I missed them deeply, and wondered where they all were right now, if maybe they were in a better place. We could, um, well, we could hide in some house or a car or something, I anxiously said as I watched the blood moon rise in the night sky. Jay, you know that they're watching us. They're following us, waiting for the right moment to pounce, Rob said to me. I didn't respond, I just kept walking. Jay, he grabbed my shoulder and I turned around to face him. My eyes were wide and my face was pale, but Rob's was calm. He grabbed the shotgun out of my hand. I want you to protect my little brother for me. I realized what he was doing. No, you can't. I'm losing it, Jay. I see things. I hear these things. Fuck, I'm a liability. I'll get you both killed if I'm around. I'll do my best to try and hold them back, but you need to run as fast as you can. He cocked the shotgun. I heard more and more growls and roars coming from the woods. They were close, and they were loud. I stood motionless as Rob turned around to face them. Go now, he shouted. I took off running faster than I ever had before. I heard a screech and gunshots, but didn't turn around to check. I ran until my feet burned and my chest stung. My adrenaline kept me going, and I couldn't slow down. I finally got to the dirt road. And I didn't take much time on it before I realized how dangerous it was out in the open like that. On the right side of the road, out in a field, I could barely make out an old broken down cabin. I made my way quickly inside. There were broken down walls and piles of junk everywhere. It seemed like a good place to hide. I decided to wait out the rest of my night there. It seemed like the best option for survival. I went inside what I presumed to be the bathroom, and I sat down in there. I was safe in there for a few hours. I couldn't sleep, so I just kind of sat there in a frightened daze. A low growl nearby snapped me out of it, though. I almost jumped up and screamed when I heard it. The growl had been right outside the house. After a few moments of silence, I heard the floorboards creak. And I knew 
I wasn't alone in the cabin anymore. I felt fear like I'd never felt before. I felt cold throughout my entire body and deep down inside. I slowly tried to control my breathing, but it just got louder. The creaking was getting closer to my hiding spot. I tried to move my leg and bumped a nearby rock, but an idea popped into my head. I slowly reached toward the stone and picked it up. I didn't waste any time and chucked as hard as I could into the darkness. I heard a loud thud on the other side of the cabin, and the creaking changed direction. This was my only chance, I thought, as I slowly crept out, still crouching. It was almost pitch black and I couldn't make out anything else in the cabin. I felt relief run through my veins once I stepped out of it. I sped up my creeping, trying to move as fast away from the cabin as I could, while still trying to be stealthy. I then spent the rest of the night creeping through the woods, moving towards the direction of the cabin and hiding in brush every time I heard a noise. I didn't think I was actually going to make it back. That night felt like a million hours, but eventually I saw daylight on the horizon. I almost broke into a cry when the cabin finally came into view. I burst through the door, frantically looking around for Jerry, and he was on his knees praying. Jerry! He turned around. Hey, where's Rob? He, um... Hey, look, I'm sorry, Jerry. What? No. Jerry threw his Bible across the room and turned around and kicked the couch. There was no chance both of us were going to make it. Without him, we wouldn't be here. Jerry wasn't listening. He was throwing things around and kicking furniture. It didn't take long for the rage to leave him. He lay down on his knees, face buried in his palms, just like Rob had been after Olivia went missing. I went over and tried to comfort him, but he just stormed into his room slamming the door shut behind him. We spent the next few days in complete silence. Jerry hardly moved, just moped around and read his Bible. But he told me of an event that happened while we were gone. He had gotten on the fishing boat and decided to patrol around the lake, see if anyone else at the few other lake cabins would be around. While he was going slowly by the shoreline, he heard whispers thought it was another human. As he steered the boat to a dock, he saw his father staring at him. He began to speed up, but stopped when he saw other people with him, including people he knew were dead. Like Olivia, we had a long conversation about those visions and how I thought this was making us go crazy. There was one other lake house on the lake, one we hadn't checked out yet. I told Jerry I was going to check it out, see if there was anyone in there. We both already knew the answer to that, but I was really wanting to get away from the cabin for a while. I loaded on the boat, brought the usual shotgun and flashlight with me. I left early in the morning so I would have most of the day to be there. I didn't want to have to stay past sundown and have to deal with all the things in the woods that came out at night. I took the boat slowly over there, watching the still water, trying to keep my mind off of things. Now that dock had an empty spot, and I tied up the boat and headed in to investigate. I wasn't sure what I expected to be inside, but it was painted red with blood. In the kitchen was the most gruesome thing I'd ever seen. There were two headless bodies, crawling with maggots there was another shotgun laying on the floor. I almost wanted a vomit. I looked around, but there was no suicide note or anything. I checked the kitchen and found some old canned food. I stuffed it in my bag, but, but I felt pretty disgusted about taking it from this house. It didn't take me long for me to start hearing the whispers again. I felt the paranoia come over me and began to develop a massive headache. Fuck it. I shouted alone to no one, and I left the cabin, 
with half the day left. While I was untying the boat, I heard something that made me stop for a second. At first, there was a low hum, and I thought it was just from my headache or tinnitus. But then it got louder, but not cover your ears loud, but more like rumbling. It seemed to come from the sky, and sounded like someone was playing a low, far-off trumpet. It only lasted around six seconds, but it was enough to deeply unnerve me. I felt a deep sense of unease come over me, and I hurriedly untied the boat. I jumped in and sped off. Now what the hell was I thinking? Going off alone again? Especially after what happened with Rob and me? I scolded myself as I got further away. But I felt an urge, a longing, and I couldn't help but turn around to look back one last time at the cabin I had just left. I saw sent chills throughout my body. Black silhouettes of people in the windows watching me. I turned back around quickly and didn't look back again. Going fast on the open water with already cold wind was miserable, but I didn't care. When I got home, I saw Jerry standing by the side of the cabin, staring off into the woods. I tied up the boat and I walked up to him. I didn't see anything in the cabin. It was empty. What are you, uh, what are you doing? I asked, deeply concerned for him. I was just, uh, I don't know. He shook his head and walked back into the cabin. Wait, did you hear sort of a trumpet noise in the sky? I asked. Jerry simply turned around and nodded his head before going back in. To my surprise, nothing ever came back to our cabin and tried to break in. We had agreed that our best chance at survival would be to stay in this cabin and ride the storm out. But the days crept by slowly and we were filled with sorrow and misery. I noticed one day a dead crow in front of our door. I asked Jerry about it, and he said he had seen lots of dead birds laying on the ground recently. I ached for some sense of light, some sense of hope. My prayers were answered, but not in the form neither me or Jerry wanted. It had been a week since Rob's death, and Jerry and I were eating dinner quietly at the table when we heard frantic knocking on the front door. I reached for a nearby pistol and slowly walked toward it, keeping it ready. Jerry remained in his seat, watching. Please help me, somebody. I heard a plea come from the other side of the door. After a bit of hesitation, I slowly opened it. An old, bloody man came stumbling in, collapsing on the floor. One of his arms was mangled beyond any use. His makeshift cast didn't cover it that well, as I could still see white bone and rotting flesh over it. Who the hell are you? I questioned, keeping the gun up. Please don't shoot. I barely made it here. You can't put me back out there. They're gonna get me. They killed everyone I know. They killed my children, my wife. All right. Okay. I beckoned Jerry to get him some water and he complied. We sat the man down on the couch and began questioning him. We asked who he was, where he came from, and everything else. My name's Daniel. Well, I've been out there on the run for weeks, moving from one broken down house to the other. Well, you're the first people I've seen alive in, jeez, God knows how long. I came from Atlanta, there was a lot of weird things going around there. A lot of military vehicles were seen everywhere. Nobody knew what was going on. They thought it was because of terrorism or something. And then the storm hit. It seemed to come out of nowhere. Everyone was trying to leave the city after it happened. It was almost impossible to get out. We were trying to reach my wife's family in Arkansas. We never made it. We only took the back roads and saw less and less people as we went. One night we were parked on the side of the road and was about falling asleep. I woke to screams, and then I was yanked out of the car and dragged into the night. 
The thing had my arm in a locked jaw grip. I had to put all six shots of my revolver into it before it even let go. Then, well, I just took off running. I didn't look back. Well, what's causing all this? I mean, what are those things out there? Well, I call them the Night Stalkers. I've yet to see what one looks like, but I know they're dangerous. They're smart, too. They mostly come at night. They're quiet while they sneak up on you. They're like lions, just these terrifying predators. So, I mean, what are they? Are they aliens or something? I continued. Like I said, I have no idea. Whatever it was, the military couldn't do jack shit. There were rumors that they bombed the cities to stop something. We also heard that the military bases became safe houses. And then we'd heard that they became chaotic and that everyone began killing each other over there. So, we completely avoided one. But these were all just rumors that we heard from other people on the road. Damn. Well, I mean, we could always use more company. I'm good with you staying here, but I'm not sure about my friend over there. I flicked my head towards Jerry, who responded by letting out a low mumbled, He can stay. Daniel started to get up, but I stopped him. Hey, hey, hey. Have you seen any sign of safety out there? Any other groups of people? We can't stay here much longer. I mean, at some point... We're going to be caught. Well, we tried to avoid any towns, only taking the back roads, but I wouldn't be so sure about other groups. Whatever is going on is weird. I don't understand it at all. Those things, you see, they're just a small part of it. The temperature hasn't stopped dropping in weeks. It's going to hit zero at some point. And sometimes... I hear things. You see, there's voices and my head starts to spin. My mind becomes clustered with hundreds of thoughts. Hell, it's like this whole event is beyond our basic perception and understanding. It's driving us absolutely crazy. Yeah, we saw some other people. And hell, they were going completely off the edge. They acted just like animals, killing each other, tearing each other apart. And even the actual animals, like dogs, house cats, well, they went batshit crazy too. Luckily, I had that revolver with me and a lot of ammo. People still go down in one shot, luckily. Too bad I dropped that damn thing on the run. It's all right. We have guns here. Jerry responded. His eyes widened. Oh, can I see them? You just hold your horses, old man. We just met you. And I think you should be more worried about cleaning off what's left of your arm. We got him in the shower and wrapped up his arm with actual bandages. But I'd be surprised if it didn't get infected at some point anyway. Having Daniel around went well for a couple of days, even though we had to keep watch on him most of the time. He cooperated and helped us make food and fish which for I had absolutely developed a hate for the taste of by now. It all ran smoothly, till about the third night. I woke to the sound of shouting, and I ran to the living room. Daniel was holding Jerry at gunpoint. Easy, Daniel. Just put that gun down. Jerry spoke softly. Well, it's not you I want to hurt. He responded bitterly and pointed the gun at his chin instead. Whoa, 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 what are you doing, man? If you fire that thing, every night walker within a mile is going to hear it. We have food, shelter, and a nice hiding spot here. You don't have to do this. You don't understand. I lied earlier. We did go through every town we could. And they were all dead or crazy. There's nothing out there but death. And we're going to die too. It's better to go out this way than whatever is going to happen if the night walkers get to you. He aimed his gun back at Jerry. Trust me. I'll be doing you a favor. 
I took this chance to rush at Daniel, knocking him down to the ground while he fired. The bullet hit a nearby candle and knocked it off the table. Daniel was bigger than me, kicked me off of him, still holding the gun. You don't have to do this. There is still something out there. It's gotta be hope. No, there isn't. Daniel put the gun up to his chin and squeezed the trigger, just as I was reaching towards him. There was a loud gunshot, and I was covered in blood. I didn't say a word. I just stood there, frozen in shock. Oh, my God, was all that could escape my lips. We both stood motionless for God knows how long. Seeing people already dead was one thing, but witnessing it happen right in front of me was something entirely different and much worse. We both stood motionless. It isn't until I felt heat at my back. My senses came back to me. I jumped about three feet away when I noticed there was a fire behind me. It had broken out when the candle fell on the carpet and was spreading. Jerry was still standing motionless in shock. Dude, come on, we gotta get this fire out. I began shaking him. He shook his head and blinked, almost like coming back into consciousness. I ran into the kitchen and began filling up a cup of water, Jerry right behind me. We frantically attempted to get the fire out by dumping the water on it, but it had little to no effect. I also began to hear screeches come from the woods, and heard them get closer as we worked. Once the fire had almost fully engulfed the living room, I knew it was time to give up. We grabbed the guns, we grabbed a few packs of supplies, and we grabbed the keys to his truck. I grabbed a few granola bars before heading into my room and packing jackets and whatever I could into a bag. The smoke stung my eyes and made it hard to breathe. I didn't want to die in there waiting for Jerry, so I ran out leaving the front door open behind me. Normally, I would have turned my attention to watch the fire, but I focused instead on the dark rustling trees and the noises coming from within them. I grew nervous and fearful that I would be stuck alone out here with any weapon and anywhere to go, and to be left to a horrible fate. My hope was rekindled when I heard coughing and turned around to see Jerry stumble out of the burning cabin carrying a shotgun in each hand. We acted quickly, throwing whatever we had into the bed and then starting the truck. We drove off in silence, and I stared out of the back and watched the flames reach towards the stars as the walls collapsed. As we drove down the dark dirt road, the dread of what just happened hit me. We had limited gas, limited supplies, and nowhere to go. It had been a little over a week since the cabin burned down. We had hardly any rest at all. We spent almost all of our time on the road, taking turns driving. The only stops we make are for gas. We can't risk staying still for too long, knowing what's out there. Every time we drive to a new town, or stop at a new gas station, I hope to see another human being but it's even rare if we see a body, and each time we do, the light of hope that runs inside me dwindles. Sometimes I feel like I want to rip my brain out of my head. The voices constantly telling me to stop, pull over, and join them. I see people I know on the side of the road, people like Rob and Olivia, people I know are long gone and now I have a constant agonizing headache. Every time we get gas, I have to get a whole new bottle of aspirin. And I try to tell myself that there's something, something else out there. But I hardly believe it anymore. I look into Jerry's eyes and I can see it too. He's nearly given up. He doesn't read from his Bible anymore, pray or barely speaks, he just stares out of the window. I always keep an eye on him, just to make sure he doesn't walk off with a shotgun and do what Daniel did. Sometimes I want to do it too, 
just to end this constant sense of fear. We have heard less and less night walkers, but even more weird things have begun to happen. For instance, we don't even hear any animals at night anymore. And one day, while we were driving, all the remaining birds began to drop dead out of the sky. And now we hear the loud trumpet noise every day. Sometimes it's only 5 seconds, other times it'll last 15. And luckily for us, the temperature hit around 10 degrees and came to a standstill. I gave up on trying to decipher what was happening around us for a long time. For all I knew, we could be the last two people on earth. And just hope that we could find some shelter out there, or some other people. And I just hope that we'll find some peace under a blood-red moon. <laughs>